my own thinking, what happened was is that what started out as a kind of a personal matter, uh, a, a, a kind of a historical study as an author and as someone who reads and this sort of thing, um, soon went further than that in the sense that I realized that um, indeed if Protestantism had moved as far away from the historical church as it seemed to have uh, in, in reading church history, particularly the history of the church before the split between the East and the West, uh, b when the Roman Catholics went off and became Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox became right. Eastern Orthodox in about 1054. Well, before that, that period of history, it seemed to me that um, if a, a sincere Christian came to the conclusion that uh, uh, his form of worship, uh, some of his doctrine, uh, some of the moral teachings now accepted, say, within the wider scope of Protestantism, had really gone off the rails in these areas, that for me anyway, it couldn't just remain a historical or abstract study, it became very personal. And I guess the way to sum it up would be uh, on a personal level, well then where does somebody go, where do you go to church? Uh, where do you worship? How do you worship? Um, if other Christians have always worshipped this way, where could I go? So for me, coming from the Western Christian perspective, to me the historical church always sort of meant Rome. So for a while, with, with friends of mine, uh, like, uh, for instance, Thomas Howard and some others, uh, I started looking very seriously at the Roman Catholic Now, Thomas Catholic Howard, Church. another author, has gone into the Roman Catholic He became tradition. Roman Catholic right. about ten years ago. And you were uh, in conversation He, he and I happened to be kind of neighbors in New England. And uh, before that, a friend of my family's, uh, Malcolm Muggeridge, who was a British yes, author, he had yes. become Roman Catholic, and I had known him and corresponded with him, and he had been a friend of my father's and so forth. So I thought, well, maybe I'll go this way. But I interestingly enough, a couple of things kept me out of that. And uh, can I sure. ask to hold off that for a sure. moment? We'll find out what kept you out of it, and then how you finally did make that decision. Yeah. We're talking with Frank Schaefer here on the Calvin Forum, and we're going to take a break right now, and we hope you'll come back in just a moment. Welcome back to Calvin Forum. I'm Bob Myring. We're talking today with Frank Schaefer, an author, movie producer, movie director, about his journey from evangelical Christianity to Eastern Orthodoxy. We got as far as your indicating an interest in uh, Catholicism. Right. Friends like um, Thomas Howard and Malcolm Muggeridge and so, both of whom became, went in, Roman, became Catholic. Roman Catholic. Right. They interested you, you said, and then a, few, a couple of things yeah. kept you back. Why don't yeah, we well, pick it up there? As I was saying, you know, coming from a Western perspective, Obviously, all Protestants are stepchildren of the Roman Catholic right. Church. We define ourselves over against yeah. them. And, and they existed before we did, and we come out of that. So I thought, well, if you're going to retrace your steps back into the historical church, you're going to have to be going into the Roman Catholic mm -hmm. Church. Plus, I, I had done a lot of work and continue to be part of the pro-life movement in this country. And obviously, every time I turn around, I'm working with the Roman Catholic, exactly. and many of them are my very good friends in that area, so it seemed something quite logical. But um, I, I guess two kind of areas uh, stopped me, and, and neither were particularly theological, more historical and personal. Uh, on the historical front, the more of the church fathers and early church histories I read, the less I could find about the pope, uh, let alone about infallibility. And what you find is, in church history, a collegial system of church government, where you had local bishops who agreed on the doctrines of the church and what was called the holy tradition, mm -hmm. which can be defined as all those things believed by all Christians everywhere since the beginning. But uh, they certainly didn't put one's authority over the other, uh, let alone give anybody infallible powers. In fact, in church history, the first time you see the word pope used, it's simply used as a term of affection, papa, uh, for the Bishop of Alexandria, and uh, that's in about the third century. And so, you know, that was one area. It really is not there. It's a later political uh, invention of convenience. There Maybe, was a Bishop of Rome. Sure. He had a great deal of honor and authority, but he was just another bishop. Maybe we should mention that uh, for those unfamiliar with church history, church history developed in the first few centuries in terms of uh, various centers of authority. That's a right. Antioch, uh, Alexandria, Alexandria, Constantinople, right. Rome, Jerusalem and a, being the original. There was a bishop located in, in each, each one, yeah. who had an area of authority, mm -hmm. and then the development of the bishop at Rome is what you're saying caused you some difficulty. Yeah, and, and it just simply is out of character with the rest of the church. And of course, in the end, it led to a split between the Roman Catholic Church and everyone else. At that point, everyone else being all the Eastern churches, right. what we call the Eastern churches, but of course, at that point, Constantinople was the center of the civilized world. It yes. wasn't, Europe hadn't moved this way yet. 
um, you know, what was going on in, in, uh, in the collapsing Roman Empire in places like France and so forth, were, they were literally sliding into uh, uh, what we consider to be and talk about as the Dark, the dark ages, ages later. The Middle Ages, right. Yeah. Then the other reason, though, had something to do with much more personal, what we were talking about in the first half. Um, and of course, I have to mention, I talk about all this in my book, Dancing Alone, for anybody more interested mm -hmm. in going into mm -hmm. it. Dancing Alone, subtitled, The Quest for Orthodox Faith in the Age of False Religion, um, goes into all this. Why Dancing Alone? Well, because I think that's the, the perennial Protestant problem. You are dancing alone. You know, confession is a muttered prayer into your pillow at two in the morning. Uh, you're by yourself. Sure. Um, salvation is purely in your own heart. It's you and Jesus. You're not plugging into any wider tradition of community and worship. It's, it's all personalized. It's all inward looking. It tends to leave you very individual, uh, very much an individual and outside of a community. Okay. It's kind of a parenthesis. But the other, the other reason was just a practical one. You know, one of the things I object to about modern Protestantism and have such trouble with is the chaos and what I would call the trivialization of worship, what I would call the pluralism of approaches to Christianity, this kind of relativistic idea that if it feels good, do it in the area of worship, whatever. Unfortunately, exactly the same thing is true of the modern American Roman Catholic Church. And I didn't want to cause all the upheaval in my life to jump from the frying pan into the fire. And, you know, I, I uh, frankly, um, uh, you know, if I wanted to join a charismatic style worship service, I, I, I would do that. But, you know, I, what I don't need is an ex Mary Knoll nun handing out pink balloons at her liturgy while somebody strums a guitar and sings old Peter, Paul, and Mary songs as the liturgy. When, when you talk like this, do you make Catholics angry? No, actually, oh. <laughs> you know, you would be surprised at something, and that is the conservative Roman Catholics yes. would actually be glad to hear me saying that, because they would say, aha, you see, here's someone who would have perhaps come into the Roman Catholic yes. Church had yes. we not devalued our liturgy right, so much, right. and they would kind of uh, score points off that in the same way that someone who might be turned off by liberal Protestantism would actually be more in the camp of a conservative or an evangelical or fundamentalist sure, Protestant sure. than he would be. So there's a reverse psychology here. Yes, yes. So my, my conservative Roman Catholic <laughs> friends like to hear me bash the tasteless uh, modern liturgies of Rome because they, um, they, they, sh they may not share my opinion about the papacy, but they certainly do about right. that. But I'm interrupting again. But what anyway, those, those yes. two things together, the kind of personal considerations of not wanting to jump from chaos to chaos, uh, combined with the historical question about the papacy, which of course the Roman Catholic Church will always force you to consider. It isn't a footnote over here somewhere. They, they build a lot around this and a lot of the later editions of Roman Catholic theology, for instance, the Immaculate Conception of Mary, this idea that she was sinless or uh, the idea of purgatory or limbo or transubstantiation in, this, in the scholastic sense of thinking that an actual molecular change takes place. These are all later editions that were only made possible because of a quote, infallible papal pronouncement, which have never been received or accepted by the rest of the Christian church, or to put it the other way, the Eastern church, until the Protestants came along and often rebelled against the same uh, things. So, um, you know, for me, I kind of ran into a dead end, and I thought, okay, the, the, this, the water runs out in the sand at this point, where will I go? And it was at that point that a good personal friend of mine who is the publisher of a newspaper I edit called The Christian Activist, which is a, a free newsletter journal on these issues, and we can talk about we, that. We will, yes. Um, he called me up, and he had been doing some similar reading and, and was on a similar journey, and he said to me, you know, before you completely give up on all of this, you ought to go to an Orthodox church. I have been going to an Orthodox church in Ben Lomond, California. That's where he lived. Come on out here and see it. So I actually got on a plane and went out. And what was meant to be a, a, a couple of days uh, with my friend turned into about two weeks. And during that time, I had what I would call a kind of Jurassic Park experience, if you've seen the movie. <laughs> yes, I have. Well, if you remember, the movie is about a guy <laughs> studying uh, dead dinosaur bones who then goes to this island, and through the marvels of modern genetic technology, they've resurrected a dinosaur. Right. And he sees a real one lope by. Well, I had been reading all these um, ancient texts and liturgies of people by St. John Chrysostom and St. Basil the Great, and James, uh, the, the first uh, bishop of Jerusalem and so forth. Um, and all of a sudden here they all were actually being done. 
um, in the manner in which the church has always done them. And I don't make that as a theological statement, but just purely as a historical observation. So it was like, well, what's this? Uh, and California, of all places. Yes, yes. You know, maybe this is a new uh, liturgical <laughs> a new ride at, Disney, at <laughs> Disneyland where they're resurrecting it, you know. But uh, that's when I, that, that was probably back in about 1989, and, and that's when I kind of discovered that um, within the Orthodox Church, uh, the very things that I had thought were just simply uh, dead and buried history are actually done and, and kept alive and preserved in their fullness. And, and really, uh, having done all this studying and reading for about 10 years, in, in a sense, I became orthodox uh, when I saw the first liturgy because at that point I understood this isn't just a theoretical manner. There really is somebody still doing this. How do you look upon your past? And how do you look upon, well, let's put it this way, how do you look upon people like me and many people watching who are members of Protestant churches? Now, you mean you personally uh, or generic? Well, no, no, okay. generically, yes. <laughs> we don't want to get you know, too personal today. But uh, I'm a minister in the Christian Reformed Church. Right. We um, very much look at our tradition back to the Reformation. Sure. You, of course, are looking much further, and there's something attractive about that. Um, but how, how do you now, as an Orthodox Christian, look back upon your own history sure. as, a, as a Presbyterian? Well, let me put it this way. Um, coming from 